Um, so what we're going to do is if you look in, if you look in the chat at the top of the chat is a list of the speakers and below that is the link to the full page with bios. So I'm not really going to go into uh, bios uh, more than uh, the simply to tell people, tell you who is speaking and a very brief uh, note about them. Um, what we're going to have is, is two speakers to provide some context uh, outside of the film and their own reflections on the film. And then we'll go to the people who made the film and made the opera. Um, so uh, we will proceed now first with Howard Jones. And if I make this work properly, you will principally see him as the speaker. That you shouldn't be seeing my icon, but I'll get rid of that. Uh, Howard, why don't you go ahead? Well, first, let me thank you very much. Am I coming through okay? Yes, you're fine now. Okay. And Howard is the author of the new book on Me Lies, so that's the basic. Let me first thank you for inviting me to this panel. And I can't help but remark that every time I see this film, I move deeply. I think Connie has just done an absolutely splendid job dealing with what has been called the, by some historians as the worst military episode of the 20th century. Another one calling it the worst one in the Vietnam War and even General Westmoreland taking an about face from his first reaction based on little knowledge to calling it the most horrible in terms of magnitude and horror in the entire war. And if you take a look at the statistics just very quickly, in four hours, less than four hours, in one day, March 16th, 1968, a little over or close to 200 American soldiers, more than half of them going into Mi Lai and a few others going into Mi Ki to the east, went into the village complex known as Son Mi and they entered Mi Lai, the first one on the left. If you present it as kind of a west to east box that's tilted a little bit, you had two platoons who entered the southwest part of Mi Lai, and then you had a group of others that would come in as a third platoon and do the mopping up. And the best thing that you could say is that the intelligence was as flawed as one could ever imagine. Intelligence had finally argued, primarily through the CIA, overriding many other sources, that there would be three to 400 of the most vicious fighters one could ever imagine from the VC 48th. And so you had a group of inexperienced soldiers, young men who had not had combat experience of any sort for the most part, going into what they generally seem to consider to be the last day of my life. And so they entered this and the result we know is that over 500 people, Vietnamese, un unarmed men, elderly men, women, children, babe, babies, all of them were slaughtered in about three hours or so at Mi Lai and Mi Ki combined. And you had a number of rapes, at least 19 that were known of. And what happened as a result of this? Nothing really. No one went to prison. No one paid any price for what happened. There was William Kelly, who ended up spending three and a half years in house arrest, and then finally was paroled after Richard Nixon had left office. He was not pardoned by Nixon, as so many people have tried to say. Now, in pointing that out, we all gather, in a sense, a real feeling of how horrible this day had to be. But look at it from the viewpoint of Thompson and Colburn and Andreata, the three I dedicated my book to, their bravery and what they did. Real courage, moral courage in an area that had sunk as deeply as one could ever imagine 
in the lack of morality, the lack of ethics and all of those things. Now granted, this is war, but there is really not a lot that one can say for some of the methods that were used in the course of this so-called battle of My Lai, as William Calley liked to call it. Now, what did Thompson know and his two crewmates? They knew that after they had circled the area first, they were in a small helicopter, three of them in a bubble helicopter, who served as William Colburn, Larry Colburn told me, they served as bait. They were to fly as low as possible, zooming around the area and draw enemy fire so the soldiers would know where the enemy was. And it was about as dangerous as one could ever imagine. They circled, did not see much, went back to Quang Nai, refueled, came back a little bit later, a little bit after eight o'clock or so in the morning of March 16th. And the first thing they noticed is that refugees they had seen walking from the village when they left were now all on the ground on the road leading to the village. And they went a little bit farther and they noticed that there was a big ditch and at the ditch were American soldiers. And then they circled closer and closer and they saw at least, they said, a hundred or so bodies in a ditch. And Hugh Thompson wanted to check into it. He landed, he got out and he yelled, who is in charge? And none other but William Calley came forward. So Thompson met Callie. He didn't know Callie from anyone. Callie didn't know Thompson from anyone, but they met first there. And Callie let him know that he was, as he said, the boss and that he outranked him and get out of here is basically what he said. And Thompson had no choice but to do that. And as he ascended back in the helicopter itself, Andreata said that even though they looked like they were withdrawing, and they were, there was one sergeant left behind who was walking up and down the ditch and killing all survivors. And so he was determined, Thompson was, to report this. And then Thompson, in flying out of the village, noticed that there was a group of around 10 soldiers, a squad, following after about nine or 10 Vietnamese women and children. And, and men, two men, two women, and five children. And they were trying to escape them by making their way into a bunker. And Thompson at that point decided to land the helicopter for a second time in enemy territory. And at that point, he jumped out and told them to back off. And they were apparently not going to do that. So he turned to Colburn and to Andreata and told them to arm yourself and if anyone interferes in what I'm going to try to do to release these people, get them out of this area, shoot them. And so there was a standoff for a while and finally the tension broke. And then one last thing that I might mention is that when they finally decided to pull completely out of there, as they were ascending, Andreata yelled that there is movement in the ditch. Land, there's movement. And when they landed for that third time, Andreata jumped out, slid down into the ditch, which was red with, with blood and water, and saw that there was one child that was living. And he made his way through pleas of a number of those who were still living, but just close to death, begging for help. And he pulled himself over, pulled the child up who was in shock, and then lifted him out of that area and they saved him. And then when Andreata and Colburn and Thompson all got together, they sat in the helicopter and they had what apparently was one of the most emotional moments you could ever imagine. Thompson said, this child is the age of mine at home. And you can just imagine the kind of feeling that three of them had. They laid the child across their laps and he flew the child back to Quang Nai Hospital. And there, after getting him there, he went in and made his report. And about 45 minutes after that period, there was an order that went out around 1120 or so to cease fire. And if he had not done that, 
instead of the number that he saw, 100 or so, there would have been many, many more undoubtedly killed before this was over. So this is a moment that I can't even begin to imagine. And I'm with what Rindy says in the course of that film, I don't know what I would have done. And I asked myself over the nine years that I spent working on this book, what would I have done? And I honestly cannot say what I would have done. I like to say, I would like to say that I would have done what Thompson did, but I can't begin to tell myself I would have. And I really admired these people more than one could ever imagine. And I'm sorry I went on a little bit longer, but I, I wanted to bring this out to you that Thompson did not know about the 500 or so, the magnitude of it. He knew about the 100 or so. If there had been one, that would have been too many, I think, from Thompson's point of view. Thanks very much, Howard. And the book is just called Me Lie, and it's, but it's listed on our resource list. Um, and you can, of course, get it from your usual source of books. Um, our next speaker is Larry Wilkerson, who, trying to remember how long we've known each other. It goes back to work we did on Cuba. Um, you may have seen him on MSNBC and uh, if you know his history, you know he was the uh, chief of staff for Colin Powell when he was secretary of state. But I only discovered when I was preparing this and looked at uh, Wikipedia, the source of all wisdom <laughs> at this point, mm -hmm. that Larry had in his own history. I knew he was a Vietnam veteran, but I didn't realize he'd been a helicopter pilot. And he had some experiences analogous to on a different scale, but analogous to you. So Larry, please go ahead. Well, I'd just like to add my uh, praise. I, that's a hard word to use with regard to these events, but for this movie, uh, for the effort of uh, Greg Sharpin and Connie Field to put it on and to do what they did with all those musicians and singers and so forth. It's a riveting movie in and of itself I'm sure the opera is too, um, and would love to see that all by itself. Um, and it's haunting in what it reveals. And Professor Jones has just given you a lot of what it reveals in terms of statistics and where it happened and so forth. And I just want to point out too that I have his book right here. Um, it has a, 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 a colon title, that is to say, Me Lai is the main title, but after that comes Vietnam 1968, and here's the key words, and the descent into darkness, because that is most surely what this was. But as others have said, and I want to reemphasize, this is not unique. This is not unique in any sense of the word. Um, in my administration, for example, after 9-11, I saw some of the worst things America has done wait, wait internationally and domestically occur me. that were not much different in terms of their gravity than what happened at Milan. And of course, we've got other examples of it during the military operations we've conducted in the 20th century in World War I and World War II in Korea and elsewhere. I just say that because some of the things I read in the chat, for example, one comment that uh, this is us. This, this is not some unique thing that uh, comes around every now and then to haunt us. This is us. We do this sort of thing. Um, and it, it's the circumstances, it's the circumstance most graphically of war, but we do these things. And we then ask ourselves why we do them. And I have to say, and I'll take this to the torture regime that we conducted during the Bush administration, which saw no accountability whatsoever, zero accountability. We had war criminals, war criminals at the highest levels of American leadership, no accountability whatsoever. As was said, no one went to jail for this. Um, Lieutenant Calley did three years, I think, of house arrest. And indeed, amongst a lot of Americans was a hero. And as, as we see, uh, if we look into this, Hugh Thompson was anything but a hero initially. Uh, Larry Colburn and Glenn Andriotis, same way. They were reviled, especially by my army, your army, 
So this is a point I, I want to bring home with as much force as I possibly can. Vietnam was America's fault. Korea was America's fault. The 20 years plus we've been at war now since 9-11 is America's fault. Benjamin Franklin once said, a republic, if you can keep it, to a woman who uh, allegedly inquired what they had achieved at the Constitutional Convention, a republic, if you can keep it. Well, we have not kept it very well, especially in the last 20 years with these endless stupid wars in Afghanistan, in Syria, in Mali, in Somalia, in Iraq, you name it, we're fighting all over the globe and many little atrocities like you saw magnified at Mila are happening all around the globe. Whether it's drone strikes at civilians on the ground who happen to be assembled for a funeral and don't have a single solitary fighter amongst them and two Hellfire missiles go down and kill 40 and wound 60 more or it's some more clandestine effort by the CIA in Syria or wherever. Right now, I can tell you that we are probably working with the Uyghurs out of Afghanistan, the Uyghurs being the Muslim, non-Han Chinese population, about 10 to 12 million of them in the Western provinces of China to try and destabilize China. We're using military contractors to do that. I can almost guarantee you there are some deaths occurring there that are more or less just like the ones you've seen depicted. This is something we do. And we do it because the American people allow us to do it. If you check with the American people, you will generally find somewhere between 52 and 53% still today, for example, in polls, support the idea of torture. But torture is against the law, domestic and international, but they still support it. And when you parse the polls, you'll find they will say things like, well, when the nation's national security is at stake, when we're in extremists, then torture's okay. I'm sorry, that's not what the law says. And that's not what human nature ought to say either. But we do it. Accountability has not been achieved for Mila. Accountability has not been achieved for the torture regime we conducted in my administration. Accountability has not been achieved for the cruise missiles we sent into Syria on specious, specious information about Bashar al-Assad using chemical weapons now being revealed as whistleblowers come out of the OPCW and talk about it. This is what we do. We particularly do it in war. And we've been at war now for over two decades with no end in sight. So that's the message I would like to deliver. Coming back to my own role in Vietnam as a helicopter pilot, I was, I was mesmerized by the eerie way the words in the opera captured me about, I always wanted to fly. I always wanted to fly because that's the way I felt too. Not at any time did I encounter the kind of circumstances that Hugh Thompson encountered, but I did encounter from time to time because in a helicopter, you're above the fray, so to speak. But if you're flying really low, like he did and I did, sometimes below the trees, under bridges and so forth, um, you see it. You, you really see it up close and personal. You're not up so high that it's just, you know, like in a B-52 or something, you don't even know what you're doing. You see what the infantry is doing. You see what the artillery is doing. You see what the enemy is doing. You see what your own troops are doing. So I encountered one or two occasions like this too. One particular occasion, I had to interpose my helicopter between the gunship above and the innocent civilians below. And one of the reasons for this was because we had this egregious thing in Vietnam called free fire zones, free fire zones. In other words, some general or some colonel, brigade commander or whatever said, this area of terrain in Vietnam, you can shoot anything that moves in. You can shoot tigers, pigs, humans, men, women, children, and everything else, because we assess that they're all, every one of them, in cahoots with the, the National Liberation Front. We call them the Viet Cong. Or even when I was there in the latter part of my tour, the hardcore Red Star wearing NVA regular army, who were quite formidable. Uh, and so you could just pop anything off in that zone. Well, I constantly, and as did my platoon of helicopter pilots, moving with the infantry through the jungle, atop the jungle, under the jungle sometimes, we had to stop that because we could see 
that these were innocent men, women, and children, sometimes eight, nine, 10 years old, sometimes babies. And you're not going to go in there and shoot these people just because the colonel or the general told you, you have carte blanche, you can shoot. But that's the kind of thing we did in Vietnam. And no one, including General Westmoreland and later General Abrams, did anything about that. They allowed that concept to continue. That is a contaminative, deadly, immoral, unethical concept. It fits into nobody's definition of the rules of land warfare. Nobody's, period. And it should never happen, but it did. We let it happen. We Americans let it happen. And we, we're going to let it happen again. I guarantee you we're going to let it happen again because we're not paying attention to it. And as long as we let these endless wars go on, can you imagine that we would still be in these wars if we had a draft and a war tax? Just think of that for a moment. If the tax man showed up at your door and said, here's a thousand dollar bill for you this week for the wars going on in Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria and Somalia. And oh, by the way, here's a death notice for your daughter or your son, or perhaps both. Do you think these wars would continue? Would they still be going on? I guarantee you they would not. We have to take back our country. We must, or we're gonna have more of what you just saw so hauntingly portrayed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Larry. Um, I'm gonna to turn to Connie in a second, and, but mention a couple of housekeeping things that I hadn't uh, at the beginning. If you have a question, use the Q&A box. And if you wanna talk out the question yourself rather than just have the speakers see it, put a note on your question and we'll try to, to fit you in. Um, if you have a comment either to one of the speakers or to everybody, or I think you can do it to the individual, any individual, use the chat box. Don't use the chat box for questions because we won't be monitoring for that. Um, we will make the chat box of the poll chat record or the significant pieces of it, um, uh, not the housekeeping, but we'll make the chat record available on the blog page uh, in a day or two. So you can go back if you want to get somebody's recommendation of a book or a link to something else. Um, I have put back into the, uh, uh, sorry, I had put back into the uh, blog, the link to that page or to the chat, the link to that page and the list of speakers. So turning now to the film and to the opera. Um, Connie, are you going to unmute yourself? And then Connie Field, uh, I first met in relation to a film she met made about the medical system in Cuba, which is certainly worth going back to watch. Um, but then we met in, in relationship to this extraordinary project. So Connie, go ahead. Yeah, I, met, I met John. I had... The opportunity to take the film to Vietnam, which is really amazing, and met up with John in Vietnam, and John took us to My Lai for the 50th anniversary there of the massacre. And what really amazed me is I got to My Lai, and there's a museum there, and you go up the stairs to the museum, and there front and center is a picture of Hugh Thompson. And around the corner is a picture of, of Larry and Glenn. Um, it, it just amazed me. I didn't know it was there. And after spending time in Vietnam, I kind of realized that, I mean, the Vietnamese in terms of what I learned and understood are very humanistic. And so they, they so admired what Hugh and his companions did that he's a big hero in Vietnam and he's not known about in the United States. So that was really a magnificent experience to have. But it was, what I'd like to do is, do you guys have any questions of each other? Okay, it's like, do Jonathan, David, Van Ann have any questions about these two people here 
who know a lot more about this subject than I think probably any of us do. Um, though you, and especially Jonathan, know a lot about it. Do you have any questions for them that you're curious about? And also if any of the performers or musicians or, or the composer or the, want to say anything, just initiative, initiating their own comments before asking those questions, you should feel welcome to do that. So I, I, I don't have, a, I'm Jonathan Berger. I, I don't have a, a question, but uh, first of all, thank you, John, for putting this together. Um, and thank you, Dr. Jones, for your, your truly moving and amazing book. Um, it, it, was, um, it was hugely important for me, to, for me to read, and I'm very moved to, to hear you, Dr., uh, uh, Mr. Wilkerson. Thank you so much. And um, also, so, so it seems to me a lot of people actually missing the film. Is that right? John? Oh, I think most of them wound up seeing it. There was some, oh. some little bit of technical problem at the beginning. And if they were watching it on a phone, they would have had to shift to a certain different page on the phone and people didn't realize that. Well, maybe um, I could ask both David and Jonathan why this wasn't very important to both of you to do. And ben Ann, for you to join. David? Go for it, David. Go, go ahead, Jonathan. <laughs> so, um, I, I, Milai was, um, was sort of my coming of age. I was, uh, my brother was, was, um, was a conscientious objector. Um, and, um, uh, and I, I sort of grew up in the shadows of this. And I, I, I learned about the, the massacre from the, from the, New York Times, um, and was sort of transfixed by it. And then, when I, I years later, I was teaching at Yale, and uh, a colleague of mine in the history department, um, we had this conversation, and he was the first one who told me to who told me about the story of of Hugh Thompson. Um, and as soon as I sort of delved into it and found out more, it was in my mind many many years ago that I would have to. Um, it, it refer to to this, and it's a story that just needs to be told, and it needs to be fathomed, and it needs to be sort of in the blood of of uh, of all of us. And the more I the more I spoke about it, the more I worked on it, um, the more I realized that you know I'm I'm teaching kids who were basically the age of Hugh Thompson when he was doing this, and um, and um, it, it just felt a, a sort of a mission to have this story be told. Um, and then um, David and I sort of met backstage serendipitously, and um, and uh, the next thing I knew, this was turning into a reality. So this thought sort of emerged from um, from the uh, the push of David, who then introduced me to Van An, and from there it was just sort of magic. And I, I just I'll just I'll just stop by by um, by giving incredible credit to Harriet Chessman. Whose, whose line I always wanted to fly, and many of her, other of her lines sort of um, delved into the inner reaches of these human beings in a way that um, I felt just made the music come out. So. I just wanted to add uh, very briefly that Jonathan knew that uh, I formed Kronos in 1973 uh, after hearing George Crumb's Black Angels, which for me was uh, the first example of um, some sort of an artistic reckoning of, as Crumb said to me once, strange things that were in the air. This, uh, Black Angels was written in 1970. I heard it as a 23 year old in 1973. And I needed to play that piece. And in order to play that piece, I had to start Kronos. Jonathan knew that story. Uh, I, I remember we had a meeting and he started telling me about Hugh Thompson and 
how could I have missed out on that? I, I try to stay in touch with <laughs> things. And there was absolutely no question that we needed to be uh, doing this together. And I had had the very good fortune of working, uh, and Kronos had the very good fortune of working with Von Ahn on a number of uh, musical things before then. And it, it to me, it her the sounds that she's able to get out of her instruments and the feeling I felt needed to be a part of whatever we did together. And so uh, Jonathan just took all of that and made something incredible uh, that we're all uh, proud of having been a part of. And as you just said, uh, the responsibility to make this for our children, our grandchildren, our students, uh, no question about that. <clears throat> um, for oh. me, uh, yeah, Fanon, go ahead. Yeah, um, so, um, but speak uh, up a little bit. Okay, um, all of you have uh, already said many, um, many points that move me, even though um, I am one of the performers in the, one of the performers in the, the opera. But every single time when I watch, when I see and even just read the music, it's, um, it's moved me for many reasons. Um, because I'm, first of all, I was born after the, right after the Vietnam War, because that's when my father got back home from, you know, being the musician soldier in the uh, Northern Army, he, 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 he didn't have any choice. He had, um, he was drafted and he had to join the army because otherwise uh, my family would be in trouble. But he, he, uh, but he, he didn't like the idea and didn't want to hold a gun to shoot people. So he signed up as a musician and play guitar and he he played terrible guitar at the time, but he got away with that. And he um, he, he 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 took his risk as a because as a uh, musician soldier. So right after the two sides start uh, stop shooting, he and his bandmate had to rush into the battlefield and play music and cheer the soldier up and his bandmate got shot by snipers. Mm -hmm. So um, so he went back um, and I was born and I didn't really know much about the war, but I just know that we were so poor in the North. So, so, so very poor. And, and I saw a lot of beggars who were who were uniforms like uh, army uniform many of them on street and i didn't understand why no but later on when i grew up and i understood that they had the trauma from the war themselves and they they couldn't go back to the normal life so participating in in the the opera helped me to also understand the point of view and feeling of Americans because I grew up in Vietnam. I moved here in two thousand, so I all of my life learned about Vietnamese and life in Vietnam. And when I moved here, I I start to have friends who are Americans and friends who are Vietnamese from south of Vietnam. So I learn and I learn stories and emotion and and pain and scars from all sides. So to me it feels like I be, I am able to one more time offer what I can to heal the pain 
and the scars of the war is there, but it is, you know, I just hope that we can just look at it and we would never do it again. So. Van An, are people in Vietnam of your age and younger, how much of this reality is in their consciousness? Um, they may see something on television or the a documentary or the news, but or get do they hear about it in school? Um, or is it, I think like for many of us who are active in the anti-war movement, uh, the time lapse backwards for us that exists from now to Vietnam would be like the First World War. And I certainly knew nothing, much less very little about the Second World War and events that took place in the First World War, the atrocities of the trench warfare on both sides that I've learned about since. That was not, not part of my being or awareness. How much is this part of Vietnamese awareness at this point in the general well, population, especially younger people? Yes, um, for the generations, now, my generation who was born after the war or uh, just, you know, a few years before, I have to say that we didn't really, we, we are quite remote uh, remorse from the the event in Milai, and uh, we do know that there is a um, American war that how we call in Vietnam the Vietnam War is we call American War in Vietnam, so um, so we learned about in the historic um, you know uh, history uh, class that we have we talk about the war a little bit but. In fact, uh, the system did not really tell what happened like the history class in America. Mainly they talk about this hero, that hero, this person, that person who sacrificed their life for, for the countries, uh, whether it is, you know, right or not. And they have the figures, people that they, we know that a lot of that is made up to to have people to look up to but um you know for in in the actual in the actual life we are grown up and see that we are we are very poor and the only thing that we we can do to get out of this situation is to, to just study and study and you know um maybe that help us somehow but if you go to vietnam um now or even way before, all the Americans are very have been welcome in Vietnam, regardless, regardless of the war, and that's the beauty that I, I and many of my friends and even my families and everyone that I know, we actually between as a human beings we do not hate each other, but somehow from the differences and the great. Uh, um, the greediness put us into fight with each other. So, so um, you know, the war left us and we still saw some scars in that. But we, we are, you know, we are moving on. And we think that it is, it is something that our parents grandparents had to go through but for us they had to sacrifice their life then for us now we try to to be better so at least that's in vietnam that we we all think that and feel that thank you um i want to go to some of the questions that were asked one of them was the say what i raised earlier is is there some way to see the whole opera? Does it exist online? Does it exist in a DVD? Um, Connie, Jonathan, somebody want to? Uh, it doesn't, uh, I, it doesn't exist in a DVD. Um, it's something maybe we could do in the future. 
Um, it just means putting it together. It's complicated on our end because we thought with, with, we shot with three different cameras. Um, and so uh, maybe, maybe that will happen. But I wanted to add one thing to what Ben Ann was talking about and, uh, and what you asked John. When, when I showed the film in Vietnam, I showed it to a bunch of students. The big auditorium is students at the school that you also teach in Ben Ann. And one of, of the things the students said, which I found really amazing is that they'd seen a lot of films about their history. But because they were watching a story that unfolds through an art form, they received it so much better and so much deeper than any of the other kinds of historical mm -hmm. presentations that they'd seen. So this was really important. And, and I wanna make sure, you know, all the three of you know that that's what they said, because that, that was your work. Um, and I, I found that really, really pretty amazing and very powerful. So David and Jonathan, nobody's recorded the full opera in performance. I did. Oh, you did. But <laughs> yes, of course I did. I said, yeah. it's not like we have it in one piece. We have to edit it. I see. Okay. And that takes time and, and, uh, we haven't done it, but if it's something that Cronus would like to do with us, we could definitely do it. And it could be, you know, a piece. We have it. Well, someone just volunteered to help financially. And so we will <laughs> get back to her and to everybody else. I think it would be a marvelous, marvelous okay. thing. Um, John Falchi We just asked, have to pay the editor. The yeah. editor just needs to get paid. Okay. John Falci asked, what caused the government's attitude toward the action of Hugh Thompson to change many years later? Howard, do you want to? I think a lot of public pressure, that was part of it. And uh, you did have a lot of work by a young professor of architecture, I believe it is, whatever, he was at Clemson University, David Egan who had seen a documentary that highlighted what Thompson and the others had done and then made it a goal in his life to get him recognized for what he had done. And he had put all kinds of pressure, petitions, everything you can imagine. And the army just pulled back from it, was not interested at all in doing this. The army at the very beginning had put the quietus on this and in the action report, wanted nothing said about what really happened at My Lai. And then later to try to tr put down the pressure from Thompson and others for what they had already revealed, they offered all kinds of prizes to them, awards and that kind of thing to shut them up. And then a little bit later, Egan comes along and tries to revive all of this. And there was a lot of debating that apparently went on. There'd be a wonderful story if you could ever get into the, the room where they were talking about this. But they had decided that they would award something to Thompson. And Thompson said that was not enough. It would have to be for all three. Well, maybe we can do that. And furthermore, it's got to be publicized. Well, I'm not so sure about that. Well, I'm sure about that. I want it done in front of the Vietnam Memorial, and I want it done with Larry there. Glenn has died, but Larry will be there with me. And what we will do will be to give a talk. And then after this, we're going to make a show about going over to Glenn's spot on the wall where it was printed and made a copy of it. Take a piece of paper, shade it in, and send this to his mother back in Missouri. And this was done on the 30th anniversary. It took 30 years for the Army to award the Medal's Honor to the Medal of Honor, which is an honor in a non combat situation, which can really be debated. But and anyway, this is during they, they, the Clinton administration. Is yes, this, during the yeah, Clinton. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And they made this award to them and they gave their talk and it hit the newspapers and the Washington Post, I believe it was, said that we met the enemy 
and the enemy is us. That it wasn't the Vietnamese, the Viet Cong, because there were no Viet Cong forces at all in these two villages. They were there earlier, perhaps, but not at the time. Intelligence had it all, all wrong. And that was something that led to about everything you can imagine. One good thing did happen in one of the uh, commemorations for uh, Thompson and they had gone back to My Lai and they had a young man came up to him and said that um, I was the young boy that you people rescued back at that time. Yeah. It, he, he came up and he had a child, he was married and it was one of the most moving moments I could ever imagine. So there was some good to come out of it. Right. Um, Larry, what, what is your take on the way the military deals with people like uh, Thompson or how did they deal with you when you used your helicopter to intervene? How, uh, how do they deal with Haverly? How do they, uh, what's, I mean, in some ways, Milai is taught at West Point, which at least is better than it being ignored <laughs> every place else. But I don't know what the impact of that is. I think the, the force of bureaucracy and the force of the institution itself and the army is a massive institution. And when it closes ranks, it closes ranks compels it to do the things that we've seen here and that we've seen in so many other cases, if you know anything about its history. Um, once you get beyond, and this is a sad commentary on our society and on our institutions, once you get beyond the political hurt, the bureaucratic hurt, the institutional hurt, that is to say all those generals colonels, majors, my own boss, Colin Powell, are gone. And they no longer can intervene. They no longer can offer their point of view, as it were. Then you can get some people who, and here's the, the continued politics of it, who can reap the benefits of the new political era by doing some reconciliation, not accountability. No, we never do that, but some reconciliation. Some, okay, let's bring this guy forward, make him a hero, give him the soldier's medal, the highest award for non-combat. And I agree with the professor, non-combat my ass. <laughs> and, and, and that's what we do. That's how we do things. A generation or so goes by and you get a new president who says, well, I can make some political hay out of this. Let's do it. And they go do it. Um, it's a sad commentary on our society, but that's the way things work. How much, I mean, we, because we're Americans, we tend to focus on uh, our stuff. In a sense, American liberals or progressives are as exceptionalist, but maybe looking at the exceptional evil we do uh, as much as the exceptional good we do. But, but we don't pay much attention to what's happened by other countries unless we defeat them in war. We're very aware of what the Germans did and the Japanese did, and of course our enemies, the te terrible things the Iraqis did. But how much do you think this is a, and we know that the Vietnamese themselves uh, did things like in Hue that, that probably some real questions in Vietnamese society have to be answered over time. But, but the, how much is that part of everybody's war, um, but either a society has to be very self-reflective about itself or it has to be defeated and forced to acknowledge it. War is war. Um, read Clausewitz, especially book eight, where he talks about the nature of war. Probably no greater theoretician of war has ever lived than Clausewitz even if you look at what he was analyzing, which was Napoleon's campaigns really and how he conducted what he did so brilliantly, brilliantly in the terms of a military commander. But we always try, and the United States has led this effort to uh, 
come along with the what I call the Thomas Aquinas approach to war, um, law, the law of war, the rules, the Geneva Conventions, for example, many of which, if not most of which, the United States in the post-World War II era, at least, was responsible for. But we only do that to a point. As soon as it comes to a point where our politics demands, we think, that we violate those rules, we do so with impunity. We have no qualms whatsoever. And generally, if you poll the American people, they're with you. 52 to 60 percent, anyway, they're with you because it's been presented to them as something that was necessary for their security. What's necessary for American security is to stop the stupid wars, to stop what we're doing overseas, to curb the appetite of empire, to stop fighting on the periphery of that empire against enemies we have no business fighting because they constitute no threat to us whatsoever. You want to read a, a good book, read Professor Akbar Ahmed at American Universities, The Thistle and the Drone. In that book, he tells you how with drones, the thistle, and other things, um, uh, we are eradicating the tribal forces in the world. We are taking out tribe after tribe after tribe. 40 case studies are covered in that book. where We're eliminating people in the world because we don't like them because they do not correspond with our idea of good imperial subjects. We're taking them out and we're using the drone to do it in many cases without the American people even knowing what we're doing. I'm not so sure that many of them would object if they did know, but they don't know what we're doing. That's the way we do business today. We're an empire. Anybody that thinks the United States of America is not an empire is smoking some really low grade stuff. We are an empire. And we increasingly maintain that empire, not with diplomacy, finance, economics, information, culture, or whatever. We increasingly maintain it with military force, bombs, bullets, and bayonets. Until we get off that, and we must get off of it or we're gonna destroy ourselves, um, we're gonna see more of the same and very little accountability. Um, several people have asked about you, Thompson. Uh, one person was asking, Howard, what you thought of the book that had been written about him. Uh, does anybody, Howard or anyone else, have anything more to say about you? I, I, with some chagrin, I realized when I first saw the film that I'd actually met him at a conference that, he, that I had attended, and it had never, he was so modest, uh, that until years later, I never quite recognized, I didn't recognize who it was I'd been in the presence of. So Howard, do you have any thoughts about the further understanding of you? I wish I did. I have wrestled with this all these times that I've dealt with me live. And no matter what I try to come up with, I just can't come up with an answer. I mean, I admire him so much and I try my best to put myself in his shoes and would I have done the same thing? And I cannot answer that question. I'd like to ask Rindy if he could somehow explain how he came across with such a convincing portrayal of what Thompson was. It was as if he had transformed himself into Thompson and the mood he created and the haunting music that the quartet and everyone put together in this opera. It sets the mood. And what really helped me more than anything in trying to understand Hugh Thompson was to talk long, long hours with Larry Colburn. I spent, I, I can't even begin to tell you how many times we talked on the phone and email and, and every, well, every way you can possibly imagine. And I cannot imagine a person who is so humble. And to me, it's even astounding that you had a young man who had just turned 18. And of course, he followed orders. Of course, he did. But when you think about what he went through after he appeared before Congress, the congressional members went after Thompson. And then when they couldn't draw blood, they went after Colburn, this young boy who was in his 
early 20s, and he stood up to them. He did not back off at all. And where did he get his advice? Thompson said, just be yourself. Go up there and tell the truth. Don't say anything less than the truth. And truth is the power you have. And this is an understanding that I believe Thompson knew. He was humble, very self-effacing. He was destroyed in this process. There's no question. He had threats of all kinds. They were all blackballed. They were threatened they, with their lives. And Thompson was sent on at least, according to Colburn, at least five separate flying missions afterward in some of the most dangerous area around the Delta that one can ever imagine. And he crashed his helicopter two or three times. One time he broke his back in doing this and finally agreed that this might be enough, that he was not going to go anymore. But he never quit. And he finally, when he died in 206, Larry Colburn was at his side. And Larry said to me that he had never met anyone who was so absolutely despondent that he had been destroyed by the way that he had been treated. He had a fit one time, angry. He was watching TV and they were parading Callie around like he was a hero. That famous song about Callie goes marching on, glory, glory, hallelujah. That was a big hit down here in the South, as you can well imagine. And th this was just, it just blew him away. I think it hurt him so much because he could not convince people of what happened. And then it just doubly hurt him when he saw Callie receiving all these accolades. Not that he wanted them. He was not the person to want them. But he was a type of person who believed that truth should, should stand tall among everything. And for that, I admire him so much, given what all happened to him and to Thompson or, and to Coburn. And Andreata died a few days after me lie, three weeks, I believe it was, in a plane, in a helicopter crash. And Coburn and others knew that he was caught in a little valley and he did everything he could to get to him and couldn't make it. So he saw him die right in front of him. Yeah. And I gather that Haberly had, who took the pictures, had a similar terrible experience with that same congressional committee. Yeah. Um, did, someone asked whether you think Trent Anger's book is useful about Thompson, or have you basically incorporated that in your work now? I've incorporated what was useful from it. Okay. Um, he, he met him, and of course, talked with him and so on. And that's always useful to get a firsthand account. Okay. But, um, I think... All right. I, the other thing while I'm talking about other people's experience... Um, if you look on the blog page, you'll see a link for the last speech that was given by Ron Ridenour, um, who is one of the sources of how, in addition to Thompson, um, one of the sources of how the story became public. And I, it's about an hour presentation with some questions. And literally, it was his last speech before he passed away from a heart attack. So spend an hour on that if you if you have the moment. Um, Doug, are you on? May I interject just very sure. quickly what you Go just ahead. said? I took the time yesterday to watch that film by Reidenhauer. I can't thank you enough for drawing my attention to it. Yeah. I don't know how I missed that. That was one of the best renditions of what happened that I have ever seen. Yeah. Great, thank oh. you. So I asked Doug Hostetter to join us. Doug is a, another member of the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee and worked for the Mennonites in Quang Nai province. Um, Doug, what can you say about My Lai and the environment around it? Uh, well, first of all, I was in Quang Nam, which was just ah, excuse me. Uh, 40 kilometers north of uh, of My Lai, <clears throat> but I was there at the time. Uh, and I, I guess one of the things that I can say is that My Lai was happening in many locations at about that time. Um, uh, I, I was aware of quite a few, not, perhaps not 
of that size, but certainly of scores of people, uh, innocent civilians killed uh, by American troops going through. I was in an area where I got to know people on both sides and would hear uh, from what it was like when the troops came through. And obviously anybody who was dead was considered a VC. Um, and, um, you know, people would tell me that, you know, the National Liberation Front had been there, um, but they of course knew that the Americans were coming. They would move out before the Americans came in. The Americans would come in uh, usually with artillery first and then with the troops later and anybody that was killed um, and the local villagers would tell me it was, it, it was all civilians uh, because the NLF uh, left before the troops came in. So the, the story uh, was familiar to me, uh, although the details are different in, uh, in many of the situations like that that happened. Thank you. I'm looking right now for uh, in the list for Michael Bilton, who just sent a chat message, who wrote and worked on the film uh, Four Hours in Milai, which was the first probably mass uh, education event. But I'm Michael, I'm not seeing you in the list if, uh, and I don't quite understand why, but if, we'll, if I can figure out, I will ask him to say a few words. Um, so at any rate, we're probably close to wrap. Um, Jonathan, David, Connie, Vanan, do you wanna add anything more from, from your perspective? Um, I guess I would say one other thing, uh, while we all would love to see the same opera, I think the combination of the dramatization of the making of the film and the personal reasons that uh, people were involved with it that comes through in your film is one of the things that elevates it and uh, you know and sort of puts the art the music within another a bigger context so uh, i would also think it may be worth your saying something about what's happened to the film since you made it and what you hope will happen to it. Um, well, before I say that, I'd, I'd like to talk about the fact that Jonathan got involved in the letter writing campaign, Howard, that helped push uh, Chief Thompson getting a medal. Hmm. He was involved with that at, at, at Yale. It was a big part of what he did. And, um, and, and you called Hugh Thompson, didn't you, Jonathan? Yeah, Can I you did, tell but, us about your call to so Hugh Thompson? It was, it was actually because of Trent Andrews. Um, so I, I had met uh, Ben Kiernan, who was a history professor at Yale, who was um, in charge of the, um, the UN investigation into uh, Pol Pot. Um, and he and I were friends. And he, he, was a, he told me about, about uh, Hugh Thompson. I then, um, I then wrote a... a, a Piece of music that I that I dedicated to Thompson, and Trent Andrews um, made Hugh Thompson aware of that. And um, so, in parallel, there was a movement, sort of an uh, academics writing a, 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 a petition to uh, award Thompson and, and Larry Coburn the uh, the Medal of Honor. Um, we, of course, academics pat ourselves on the back, think thinking that we may have had something to do with it, but I'm sure. Um, I'm sure that's not the case, but um, but um, when but Andrews um, called and actually arranged for a brief telephone call with Hugh Thompson, who um, who said um, I, I, he thanked me for writing this piece of music with his name on it. And he said um, he doesn't really know what that means, but it's sort of like having a sculpture without without that you can't touch, which I thought was very touching, was very very moving. Um, and years later, when uh, Larry Coburn um, and I got close, which was uh, which was really profoundly important to me, it was through the music of Bob Dylan, which he was he revered, and uh, we found common grounds on that. But um, 
but Larry, towards the end of his life, actually sent me Hugh Thompson's wings, which I which I have, um, and and treasure. That's that's really wonderful. Well, I'd like to share with people that um, people, if you go to our website, which is clar claritifilms.org, I think uh, John has will list that. Um, everybody, you can see the film. We we have it uh, posted. We would like to be able to. I think we'd love people's help in terms of, of getting the film uh, to more educational institutions that would use it to talk about, you know, war and morality, which, the, you know, this really does talk about. So if anyone in our audience can, can have some suggestions, we'd like to do better uh, in terms of reaching um, those populations. We did send out a mailing. Um, it, didn't get a lot of uh, uh, response, so we could probably use some uh, more recommendations or if people have ideas for us, that would be great. And Jonathan can put uh, my email there, anybody can write to me. And um, that, that would be really wonderful because I think it, it's, a, it's a very important story. Um, I think that, um, uh, and also to be shown in military institutions, Larry. Um, I think it could also be very useful that way. And I think it, it's because for me, it's because the heart of this film is, is this wonderful art presentation of what happened, you know? And, and, and so I think it tells a different kind of story and, and in some ways, even more powerful than a straightforward documentary can do. Um, so that would be wonderful to get it to uh, uh, those kinds of audiences. So it could start those conversations. We should, we should try to get you, and I know the group to do it, up at West Point and mm -hmm. to bring your, some of your people up there with you, just as you've mm -hmm. done here, show it to the cadets Mm -hmm. um, I think we could do it under the rubric of teaching them about the law of war and how you were supposed to uphold it, not break it. Um, right. We did this with Why We Fight, Eugene Jarecki's mm -hmm. film. It was unbelievable. We had 1,200 cadets in the auditorium. The tax told us they had to leave at nine because they had to get up at four, et cetera, et cetera. They didn't leave until midnight. The tax had to order them out. They were so concerned with the message that film delivers and asked brilliant questions and got good answers and asked more questions. So that's the kind of thing we should try to do. That this. would really be great. So as soon as we get rid of this COVID <laughs> or, or we could do it like this, I don't know though. So, um, I'm not sure it's, it's quite as effective, but we could, we could do a, a similar you know, kind of thing for the class. Yeah, you'll without having the, to wait, <laughs> to, we you'll can see be on together. the Clarity Films webpage that it is also available in a DVD format, so that it can be used in a religious institution or a school. Um, I think there's some additional fees if the institution can can pay them, since like every other film project, the budget is never met. Uh, but uh, if uh, you know, so if you can think of other ways that it can be used either through the link or that you can rent for like $5 for a day, um, which is uh, certainly worth the cost, uh, but also uh, using the DVD for. Um, so Vanan, Jonathan, would you like to say anything more? Well, first of all, I, I want to thank Connie for documenting this whole process. It was a long and amazing project. And of course, Von Ahn and David, who's no longer here, and um, everyone involved was, uh, um, you sort of have created a family around it. It's a bit premature for me to say, but um, the recording of the, uh, of, the, of the piece will be released uh, in the coming year. And around that, we're hoping to, um, to, to build a, a, a sort of a, a, a web-based documentation. And so, um, so all of the panelists on here, I hope will be a part of that. And the many um, uh, comments that came through, um, please please contact me if you're interested in being a part of that and, uh, 
and we will start putting that together soon. So thank you very much for keeping this story alive and, and in the public eye. Banan. Um, yes, so from my own experience, I, I think that um, if there is a way to share this story to the younger generations or generations that, you know, uh, continue to carry on and, and you know, continue what we have done. I think that a story, a story like this, and because it's in the, um, the experience goes through an art form is like Connie said before, even in Vietnam, when our gen generation quite remorse from the, the experience of the war, uh, but because it's, it's, it's built in an art form, then it is much uh, it's uh, it's more um, um, you know easier to approach, understand, and and share the feeling, and feel better and feel deeper. So I I do uh, teach and talk about this, and uh, you know in various store, you know schools, high school, uh, universities at the course like um, Asian American Studies or even uh, American Experience. So I think that if we can share like with um, this story at National War College or, Ch or West Point, I think that help the, the future um, soldiers to understand that where they can have the courage and where, you know, where is a lie that when they, they you know, they ask to obey or they, they, they have to do something to rescue life. So, I think one thing, one thing came out of this to me to the you know working in this also like I remember vividly that um, you know saving one life is saving life. So if you save one life, you you save a lot. Um, so that's that what I learned. So I hope that that this message and you know this story will be shared more. To, to, to younger generations. Thank you. And you'll see with Vanan's bio, a link to her webpage. And I'm sure there's some extraordinary musical performances available through that webpage. So I encourage you to take a look at it. Um, Larry, Howard, do you have any last words? I'll just say this. Um, I just met this young man. He just joined the Eisenhower Media Network, of which I'm a member. He wrote a book called Un-American, A Soldier's Reckoning of Our Longest War. His name is Eric Edstrom. He was up and coming, West Point a graduate, commanded the Old Guard here in Washington, the infantry's premier unit. Read this book and see that My Lai is happening over and over again in this case in Afghanistan. Afghanistan, I, yeah. I wondered which war. Howard, anything more? I just wanna thank Larry for putting this in the proper context by showing that Milai was not the first, not the last. And I think that's the most important thing that you can take away from this. And I really, really thank Connie for inviting me way back when to be part of this and to talk with her about this project and all the members of the Quartet and and Rindy and all the others. What a magnificent job! Yes, thank you. Well, I am going to now make, if I can get there, we go a commercial announcement. Um, uh, the this program was organized by the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. Um, like filmmakers, we are always have a handout not just to shake it, but to ask for contributions. Um, and you can do it through the website, vietnampeace.org. On the 22nd of this month, we'll be doing a webinar on the role of religion in the anti-war movement and in contemporary social movements. And then on April 4th and the several days before that, we'll be, <laughs> doing things that focus on Martin Luther King's very important speech at Riverside Church, the Beyond Vietnam speech. Um, 
Dr. King, who is in this picture, obviously this is Photoshop, neither Dr. Spock nor Dr. King were part of VPCC, um, but uh, they, Dr. King's anniversary <laughs> of the speech and then a year later of his assassination seemed to us a good time for people to focus on the content of that speech. We have an extraordinary group of people, including three Vietnamese and actors, performers, uh, and activists reading sections of it online. Um, and we're encouraging people to create local events uh, reading it. Um, I will be sending everybody a note with links to those things. And also, as soon as I get it up on YouTube, the link to this program. And as I say, if you go back to the chat page, or not the chat page, the blog page, you will see the, the chat. Um, so uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us. We held most of the audience to the end. Um, and that's always an accomplishment. <laughs> if you watch the film and then watch the panel, you spent much of your, your uh, afternoon with us or the West Coast morning. So um, thank you again, Howard, Vanan, Jonathan, Connie, and Doug, thanks for adding in your experiences. So uh, be well, everybody. And uh, you, I will close it all off. Uh, but uh, if anybody has personal things they want to say, just send me a note and we'll continue to talk about it. Um, I hope, we hope that every year we will do something that will help people to think about the anniversary. Certainly we'll be able to link them to this program and to the film. Uh, and maybe we'll do, be able to add additional live content next year. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's an anniversary that will always ought to always be part of our awareness and ought to be a larger part of our national awareness. So have a good Thank recovery, you. everybody. Uh, we've had our two shots. I think several other people are now <laughs> moving in that, have had them are moving in that direction and maybe by, uh, we'll follow the president's advice to have a small 4th of July party with our friends. So that'd be good. Thank you. Well. Yeah.